welcome to this lecture on elementary features of batteries. Much of the material is from these two textbooks. So if you look at a battery, uh, the primary physico-chemical requirements are rather simple. So a battery consists of an exothermic redox couple which when reacted gives rise to electrical power. So let me clarify and elaborate what I mean by that. First, there is a redox couple. So redox means there is a reduction component and an oxidation component. So couple means there is a pair of reaction. So involving electron transfer. So one component is zinc let's say, giving rise to zinc 2 plus plus 2 electrons. So this involves electron transfer at this electrode-electrolyte interface. And the other electron transfer reaction is this one. Copper 2 plus in the solution reacts with electrons from this electrode, giving rise to deposition of copper. While this occurs, these two reduction oxidation um, reaction occur. There is an electron transfer from this electrode, okay, to this electrode. And there is also an ion transfer across this salt bridge. These have been uh, clarified in a previous set of lectures, uh, which is in the lecture series on introduction to electrochemical uh, engineering. So if you are uncertain about what a salt bridge does and so on, you can refer to these uh, the set of lectures in the other playlist. So, so how do you choose uh, the redox couple? So you want to generate an electrical power Therefore, what we need is an exothermic reaction. So if you have if you have to if you have a redox couple that reacts together in an endothermic manner, we typically call that electrolysis. We need to supply electrical power to run an endothermic reaction. But in this case, we have a redox couple which when reacted together, uh, they react in an exothermic manner. So this chemical energy, the exothermic chemical energy, gives rise to an electrical power. So how do you choose the redox couple? So if you have information about the reduction potential, the standard reduction potential, um, that is good enough to come up with uh, what are some necessary condition to um, which when, uh, how do these redox couple combine together to give rise to electrical power. For example, in this case, the two redox couple have reduction potential uh, as given here. So also you will have some intuition, okay? So in the sense that one of the material here, zinc, is more electropositive than uh, copper. So what do you mean by that? Typically, zinc would like to be in the zinc 2 plus state and typically, um, copper 2 plus or cations of copper would not like to be cations of copper, but would like to be in the zeroth state. Okay, so these are all relative terms. What we mean by that is we are thinking about zinc, zinc 2 plus, copper 2 plus, copper. Okay, so on relative terms, uh, this is more electropositive, zinc is more electropositive than copper. So, uh, you can think about it from standard reduction potential tables or just from chemical intuition, you can try to combine uh, what, pairs of redox uh, couples. So, and then how do you, once you have these two numbers, the typical battery potential uh, can be obtained. So, that is given by, typically, there's by, go, you buy by, go by sign convention, the potential of the Redox couple that is on the right minus the potential uh, of the redox couple that is on the left. So in this case, it comes 
to 1.1. So this is another representation of what is going in this uh, same redox couple. You, instead of a Sol bridge explicitly shown here, so you may have a separator. What the separator does is it keeps this component uh, from not mixing with these components. So these two chambers are separated physically by a separator, but the separator is capable of certain ion transfer. In this case, sulfate ion can get transferred from one of the chamber to the other chamber to maintain uh, charge balance as these reactions occur. So that is the main, two main um, functions of a separator. The first function is to keep the components, um, most of the components of this system separated from the components of this chamber. And then the second thing is to allow for one of the ionic species to get transferred. In this case, it is a sulfate ion that gets transferred. Then all other requirements um, of typical what you see in a typical electrical circuits will also be met in the sense that if you have an electronic current that gets transferred via the wire, it has to be balanced by the ionic current through the electrolyte. So these are the, the simplest requirement for a battery. So this being so, you can ask the question um, just to make sure we understand the requirements clearly. Just one more before we go into that, I want to add one particular thing. So um, this potential can be represented using Nernst equation. Again, if you're not familiar with what these terms are, you can look up lectures which we have presented in the past on electrochemical cell potential. So whenever you have certain issues of um, thermodynamics or elementary principles of electrochemical transport um, and electrochemical kinetics, uh, it has been covered in previous lecture that is available in this channel. So let's again come back to the question to clarify the principles here. How do you, how you should not be constructing a battery? So this system looks very similar to the previous system, okay, in the sense that you have zinc, zinc 2 plus, copper 2 plus, copper, right? So if I put a voltmeter, would I get um, um, good reading? That's the question we want to be answering. And is this a good way to make a battery? So what I'm trying to stress here is in a battery, you want to be converting chemical energy to electrical energy. However, if you have a system as presented here, what would happen is that zinc here would react with copper 2 plus in the solution. So just to clarify, this is a notation here. S means solid. This means solution. This species is present in solution or in the aqueous. This is a water medium, so aqueous or in general, it is present in solution. And then this copper would get deposited on top of zinc, right? So this is again copper formed in the solid state and zinc 2 plus would come out to the solution. However, this is also exothermic in reaction. However, the energy would get released as heat. You would not really get electron um, transfer from this electrode to this electrode. Hence, there is no conversion of this chemical exothermic energy to electrical current and electrical power. Um, this exothermic reaction gets converted into heat. So this is not a good way of making a battery. So you have to have two electrochemical uh, reactions that take place in different electrodes. So in this case, the electron transfer between zinc and zinc 2 plus uh, species copper 2 plus and copper species would tend to occur in the same electrode itself. Okay, so there's more like uh, what we would 
think like galvanic corrosion and so on. Okay, so this is not really, um, this is more like a chemical reaction involving electron transfer and not an electrochemical reaction, right? So just to contrast, here we have this occurring on this electrode and the other electron transfer reaction occurring on um, this electrode and the two chambers are in a way electrochemically separated and the electron transfer occurs only across a wire. Okay, so there's no electron transfer between these two species in this case. Let's move on. So perhaps the most common um, battery um, is the lead acid rechargeable battery. So the overall reaction can be considered here. So here you have uh, lead on as one of the electrode, lead oxide as another electrode. Um, these two combine um, and give rise to lead sulfate in water. Okay, so in the discharge reaction, this is exothermic in uh, nature. And how do you recharge this battery? You apply external DC power and then you convert these into these components. Okay, so uh, there is a limit to the number of cycles that are possible. We will go into these issues uh, as we progress along um, this course, the set of lectures. So um, again, here, this is the overall reaction. So electron transfer is not explicitly shown here. So if you look at the reactions, electrochemical reactions that are occurring at individual electrodes, you, then you would notice an electron transfer explicitly mentioned. So in this case, uh, lead oxide forms lead sulfate here. And uh, in this electrode, uh, lead um, also gives rise to lead sulfate in this case. Okay, So these are two what we would refer to as half cell reactions. These two, when combined, uh, give rise to this reaction. Um, so at each of the electrode electrolyte interface, the, um, the electrochemical reaction can be reversed. In one case, it occurs spontaneously. In the other case, you have to supply energy. Okay? So typically, when we refer to the battery voltage, okay, so we typically um, ref give reference in the open circuit condition. Okay, So that is the before the battery got discharged, you would take a measurement, and uh, that is the measurement you would tend to typically give. All right, so we will again uh, come back to this question uh, a bit later. All right, and then you, from the open circuit condition, you close the circuit, then the battery gets discharged. All right. So um, typically lead acid batteries, uh, because it has lead, um, it is very heavy, okay, compared to in contrast to, let's say, lithium-ion battery, its voltage is also lesser compared to a lithium-ion battery. Um, therefore, lead acid batteries were typically used in stationary storage um, applications. However, because at that time, there were lesser options, they were also used in as car batteries, okay? So, um, um, uh, but nowadays, if you want to have batteries for transport applications, you typically do not use lead acid battery. However, uh, for uh, many, many decades, uh, lead acid battery has been used even for transport applications. In, in, when, when I say transport application, it is, it is not an electrical vehicle. Okay, So even if you do not have an electrical vehicle, um, even these, let's say, uh, petrol-powered um, cars also have uh, a small component, um, which is which would be a battery. And for that application, lead-acid battery has been utilized. So this is probably the largest commercial uh, battery okay, in terms of numbers that have been produced. However, 
it has certain disadvantage. First, you don't want to be using lead um, that is um, harmful to the environment if it gets spilled over to the environment. Um, then the potential from a lead acid battery is typically less than that of what you get from a lithium ion battery. And um, in addition, lead is quite heavy. Okay, so these batteries are typically um, um, heavier compared to a lithium ion battery. However, if you've seen, let's say, an UPS system, that is an uninterrupted power source, um, especially in India, for example, most of the battery systems that go into that um, UPS are have lead acid battery and not lithium ion battery. So it's important that you understand um, what are the half cell reactions and the working principle um, underlying lead acid battery. So this is another common uh, configuration for a battery, what is called a button cell. Um, Again, you have a um, cathode and an anode um, separated by a separator, and there are other components, all right? So typically, um, when you say anode and cathode, okay, so when you're, let's say, referring to um, a rechargeable battery, so you're talking about these two systems being anode and cathode during discharge, okay? So when you recharge the battery, what was a cathode becomes an anode and what was an anode becomes a cathode, okay? So when, when you, for a rechargeable battery, you typically refer to an anode and cathode um, during uh, that electrode um, behaves like a cathode or a particular electrode behaves like an anode during discharge, okay? So because uh, this ambiguity is there, that is what was a cathode during discharge would become an anode during re during the recharging process, we tend to avoid the use of cathode and anode for a rechargeable battery. Instead of that, we typically say uh, there is a, a positive and a negative electrode, right? So this again comes from uh, the early stages of um, um, electrical uh, circuits, that is the current goes from the positive electrode to the negative electrode, okay? So when we say uh, current here, we we're typically talking about a conventional current and not the electronic component, uh, electronic current. And the um, electronic current is in the opposite direction of the conventional current. So um, if you're talking about a rechargeable, rechargeable battery, the terminology which you would uh, see most often is a positive electrode and a negative electrode. But if you see cathode and anode being referred, it is in the discharge process. So there's again um, a cross section of a uh, button cell. Um, it has a gasket which keeps it tightly closed. It has a negative electrode and a current collector. Okay, so that can be. Um, a uh, highly conducting material. This is a, a negative cap, which is a current collector. So you have a positive electrode uh, and um, a positive case, which acts as a current collector, uh, which may act as a current collector here. Okay. So what is to be noticed is that um, this current collector, okay, the positive case is separated from the negative cap. Okay. There is an, uh, these are not the, the current. Um, cannot get transferred via these two things. So the else it will get shorted. So these two are um, not uh, electrical. There's no electrical conduction path between this positive case and the negative cap, uh, cap, all right? And then the negative electrode mixture is also separated from uh, the po uh, positive electrode mixture via a separator, right? So Again, if there are any questions, we can discuss um, when we meet in person. So for any electrical device or, or an electrochemical device, the I versus V, okay, or 
that is I is refers to current and voltage that is of importance. Um, in the case of a battery, what we are looking for is an electrochemical device which can supply constant potential. So here, what are we plotting? We are plotting on the y-axis, we are plotting cell voltage. On the x-axis, we are plotting time, right? So the as you, let's say you take a battery, uh, let's say a fully charged battery, in the open circuit condition, it may have uh, this voltage. Okay. As soon as you close the bat, um, the external circuit, the the voltage decreases uh, to a particular uh, value. Okay. So we'll see why um, there is this decrease in the context of a battery. However, to understand this decrease, we have uh, we have laid down the physical principle, physical chemical, electrochemical principle in some previous lectures. You can also look at that. Uh, but here, uh, what I want to stress is that compared to the potential in the open circuit condition, uh, during the operational um, part of a battery, there, there is a decrease in voltage. Okay. However, what is to be also noticed is that the voltage remains more or less constant. Right. So this is an ideal feature of a battery that you should have a plateau in the voltage uh, profile, okay, for a long period of time, okay. So this is the useful life of a battery. Then, as it comes to a condition where it's going to be completely discharged, the voltage again decreases rapidly, okay. So this decrease in potential, this decrease in potential, um, are due to different so-called over potential. We have addressed. Uh, these kinds of issues in some previous lectures. So, but what we want to be just emphasizing here is that for a battery, the useful life consists of this flat region, uh, wherein the potential remains more or less constant. So, here we are plotting cell voltage uh, with respect to time. You would also see um, uh, this feature of a battery where the cell voltage is again in the y axis. But uh, instead of time, you are talking about a uh, fraction of capacity discharge. So there is, in fact, one-to-one -one correlation between this axis and this axis. So I would like you to notice a few things here. So if you look at typical uh, lithium-ion batteries, the voltage is much higher compared to uh, batteries which are used for a long period of time. For example, we talked about lead acid battery. The lead acid battery is just around about around two volts, whereas lithium battery is close to four uh, volts and so on. Um, these are all aqueous battery. Um, these are all typically non non aqueous battery. So these have water in the electrolyte. So and the potential is much lesser than what you get of from a lithium ion battery. So even here, there is this sudden decrease that is not uh, explicitly shown um, in this uh, picture. It's not evident in this picture, uh, but there is this drop from the potential that you observe from an open circuit condition. And again, there is a rapid drop as the battery is about to get completely discharged. So you typically do not operate in this regime. So you try to uh, keep the battery from completely draining off. Uh, so this is the useful um, regime for battery operation. So in the next set of lecture, um, on the next lecture, we would go into the classification of uh, batteries. Um, typically, this is done based on uh, battery chemistries or whether it's rechargeable or not rechargeable. Rechargeable. So thank you.